Alright guys, so I'm going to be installing this geothermal system in my house. The first thing I need to do is dig out this pond. This is where I'm going to put the pond loop, right here. And I know it's only three or four feet deep here. So I need to dig it down pretty much as far as I can. But I'm aiming for about eight to ten feet deep. So the loop's going to go here. We're going to trench it up over and into the house on the utility side, on the, on the front side over there. The reason I'm trying to do it right now is because I just put that quick coupler on there. And I'm about to install the thumb, but before I do that, I'd like to dig this all out before I put the thumb on. Because I'm putting a brand new thumb, it's a lot of money, it's a nice thumb. I don't want to be digging with it immediately after I put the thumb on it. So I'm just going to do that now, and then I'll put the thumb on, and then we'll put the rest of the geothermal system in later. I know I'm going to be taking a lot of material out of this pond, all in this area. So I'm just going to put it over here, stockpile it for now, let it dry out, and then I'll probably dump truck it off to another area later on.
Okay, so several months later, we're gonna finally get this geothermal system installed. So what I did here was brought in some four inch minus with no fines. This is big rocks with no fines. What I wanna do is fill in from here to there. Just gain back another like maybe four feet here. But the other purpose of this is to make it so that this doesn't erode because right now this is a like an eight foot cliff that goes down in the water. So if you have a lot of weight on there, like heavy equipment or trucks or something, it could erode into there. And I don't want that because the geothermal loop is gonna be right there. And I don't wanna be putting stuff on top of the loop once it's in the water. So I'm gonna put this in before I put the geothermal loop in and it's gonna kinda of taper like this and it's gonna make it so the bank doesn't erode and hopefully it's enough to bring back some land here too which I was gonna just put some of this back here, but there's so much clay and fines in it that that could also erode too. So I'm just gonna bring my skid steer over and just sort of push this into here. And we'll see how far it goes. This is all I could get, it's Saturday. So another load or two would have been nice, but Eric's coming on Monday to hook up the geothermal system. So we're gonna get as much as we can done until then. So I didn't really gain any real estate back here, but at least I realized how dangerous this bank was because I put a lot of fill in here and it just sunk right out of sight like it was nothing. So, which means that I definitely did have a cliff going straight down probably eight feet, which means eventually this could have eroded into there and probably when I had a piece of machinery right there. So now it tapers down like that so it shouldn't erode. And even if it does erode a little bit, it's not gonna like tip the machine over. What I also didn't want is for the geothermal loop to be in there and then something erode even without a machine being there because then it would cover over top of the loop, which you don't want. So I got the rest of this pile here that I need to get rid of. There's a couple different things that I got going on right now. I need to install this loop. It's gonna come in right through here and be something like that. But at the same time, this is where my solar panels are going to be. So rather than dig for a new trench in the future for the solar panels, what I'm going to do is put conduit in the trench with these geothermal pipes and bring it over to here. And then somewhere's right about there, I'm going to Y off of there and go over there with the conduit. That way it's all set up for the solar panels. So right now I need to get rid of all this fill and this concrete right here. I need to ship this out of here because I want to be able to flatten this out and get it kind of ready for the solar panels because I'm going to have conduit sticking out of the ground. So I don't want to have to work it later with that conduit in the way. I suppose if I run out of time, I could just keep the conduit underground for now and then just undig it later and bring it over there. But I need to be able to get my telehandler in here to set this geothermal loop. So I need this pile going regardless. 
So that's what I'm gonna work on right now. I have other projects next year that I need this fill for. So I'm gonna dump truck it out of here and bring it up to the beginning of my property. And then we'll have a lot more room to work here. So there's a lot more room in here now. Plenty of room for the telehandler to turn around and face this way. On top of that stone, I put some of this fill and then I put some more stone on top of that. So. so now we need to dig a trench from right there and come out and around this way and that way and then to the pond and the reason I'm making such a big swoop around is for two reasons first of all I have some drainage coming in from right here from the pond going into that pond and then the second thing is I'm gonna put an addition on here in the future I don't know how far out it's gonna go but I want to leave plenty of room so I want my trench to be out here which is about 30 feet away. I was thinking to come out with like a 16 foot to 20 foot addition. So that should be plenty enough to leave some room over here for machines. I can always knock down some trees if I need to. That leaves plenty of room out here to have the addition plus some and not be next to those pipes. And that's my utility room underneath of that entryway right there. So that's perfect. I just need to cross the room with the pipes and that's it. So it's about 130 feet of trench from there to the pond. And that 130 feet also helps because that adds length onto the geothermal loop.
tank, you good? Yeah. Yeah, this isn't so bad now. So this is the utility room in my basement. And right now, what I want to do is get as many things as I can done that I can do. So that way when Eric shows up on Monday, he only has to do the things that he needs to do. And he doesn't need to do things that I can do. Because he only has a limited amount of time to be here. So I want to make sure that he's doing the things that are the more advanced things to do. Things like most of the stuff on the radiant side of the system I can do and that way he can deal with most of the stuff on the geothermal ground loop side. So that's a three ton unit water to water. Here's our flow center. We got lots and lots of parts to install. So rather than have him get caught up with all this radiant stuff, I can do this and have it all set up for him. So I'm gonna set a manifold here. I got a 12 port manifold and I got 10 loops that are gonna go into it for now and I'm leaving two for expansion for later. I got three loops coming out of the basement slab. I got three loops coming out of the first floor slab and all that's just gonna be on one zone, one zone and then that's for the second floor which I have four loops coming out and those are all going to be separate zones so it's hard to set up this basement without knowing exactly what the end result is going to be so that's why i have things set up the way they are some things are going to change like my cold water coming in i got a manifold right there but some of these things are temporary and then that's a temporary water heater right there so that's going to come out because my new water heater is going to be powered by the geothermal system and then that's a buffer tank for the geothermal system. That's 120 gallons, that's 80 gallons. And then the hot water manifold will be there. This washing machine and dryer is not gonna be here anymore. That's gonna be on my second floor. I'm gonna to try to put the flow center right there. Basically the flow center, I'll get into this later, but to just give you the gist of it, the flow center is basically the pump and the mechanisms to bring the loop in from the outside. And I believe that's where you would hook up the flush cart too. And that might be gibberish to most people, but once I get that installed, I'll show you exactly what it does.
All right, so that loop looks pretty good. That one looks acceptable. This one kind of looks almost like it's unacceptable. I just don't like the look of that. But I don't know what else I could have done. One thing I probably could have done is just flip the manifold over. I've done that before, but I also got a lot of comments saying that you're not really supposed to flip them over. I guess people were saying that some dirt and stuff could accumulate in the bottom of these and you can never get it out if you have them upside down. I don't know how true that is. I think they'd be fine if they were flipped upside down, but I think this will be fine for now anyways. I can always change it in the future if I want to. So I still have these two loops left for additions. And I also have a loop for my back porch, which I'm probably going to make into a enclosed porch. So I'll need to heat on that. That will probably be like a next year thing, but the additions are going to be in the future, like a couple years from now. So I guess the idea is that future loops can come in through the bottom in that way. And, and the more I look at that, the more I absolutely hate that, the way that that's done. I really just don't like the look of that. But we got so many things to get done that I'm not going to worry about it right now. I can always change it in the future. So this trench is mostly to the pond, but I don't want to connect it all the way. I want to leave just a short little section so that the water from the pond doesn't cave in into the trench. So the next thing I need to do to get prepared for this geothermal system is going to be core drilling down there through into the utility room. Now, if you guys remember a few videos ago, I used a core drill rig to core drill up in my gable ends and over my parents' house with a six inch core bit. So for this situation, we don't need that big of a core bit. So I got a smaller core drill from Blue Rock and let's take it out and see what it's all about. So just like with the other core drill, it feeds water through a hole in the shaft there. You can hook it up to a garden hose. This seems a lot more efficient for doing something like this because I only need to drill a two inch hole, but I'm thinking three inches just to make sure. The geothermal pipe that's going through is inch and a half, but the outside diameter is more like two inches. So I guess two and a half inches would be ideal, but I figured three inches should do it. So this is a kit that I got from them, which has one, two, three, and four inch bits. So we'll be using this three inch bit. And like I said in the last video, this is the kind of teeth you want for cutting through rebar which there's a good chance that I will go through rebar. 
but the whole purpose of getting this one was because it's much more portable and you don't have to set up a half inch anchor bolt either and another neat thing about this is on the back it's got a little bubble so if you're drilling down you can know where plumb is and if you don't need that on the back which i don't really because i'm not drilling down i'm drilling horizontal you can unscrew that and there's like this threaded spot where you can put this on just to make your life a little bit easier so you can push better I guess I'll utilize that because I don't need that bubble on there it's got two speeds and a lot of people in the comments said that if you wrap some metal around here like some copper wire or some solder wire just something that's not as strong as steel then it will make taking this off a lot easier so I'm gonna do that So the only drawback to a core drill like this is that it doesn't have a pilot bit. The reason for that is that hole in the shaft is for using it with water. So basically you can have one that either uses water or has a pilot bit. And to be honest with you, I think I would prefer being able to put water in it because that's a big thing with core bits. They make a lot of dust and it wears these bits out a lot less if you can keep them wet. So there's several different ways you can get this started without using a pilot bit. One method is to angle it so just part of it is going in until you start going in and then you angle it down just a little bit more. So in other words, you start out like this, just enough to get it started and then as it's going into the concrete, you tip it down until it's 90 degrees. But I think on this ICF wall, I can pretty much just start right in the foam and the foam is soft enough that it'll bite really quick and go in. And as soon as it gets into the foam, like an eighth of an inch, it'll guide it the rest of the way. That's my theory anyways, I'm, I'm thinking that'll work. The other way that you could do this is to take a board and drill a three inch hole in it and then put the board up on the wall and use that to start it with. All you're trying to do is make it so it doesn't wander around as you start. As soon as it gets into the wall, even an eighth of an inch, then it's not going to wander around anymore and you don't need to guide it anymore. Well, that was easy. wasn't too bad I mean it's not as luxurious as mounting it and not having the push on it but it definitely did the trick it wasn't too strenuous and it was pretty quick this drill has a clutch but I never got it jammed up enough where it needed it this drill came in a kit with the four different bits one two three and four inch and I think the whole kit was just under six hundred dollars for it so it doesn't take too many times of renting one of these to equal that and plus like I said in the last video 
I don't even know if you can rent one that has these kind of teeth on it that actually cut through rebar. So I'd say if you have at least two holes to drill, buying one of these would probably be worth it. Now I could have set the other drill up and gone through all the effort to put the half inch anchor in and cut the foam away around it. But I specifically didn't want to do that because this is a smaller hole and I don't think it's worth doing that. Because that's a lot of work when you go through all that. Yes, it's a lot less work once you're set up, but in the meantime, just the whole adventure is a lot more work and a lot more time. So we need to get all this stuff out of the core bit and then we need to drill another hole right next to this one about eight inches to the left. And then we're gonna drill another one up about 16, 18 inches somewhere up in there for electrical conduit for my solar panels. The water pressure just pushed it out as soon as you hit the trigger. Centrifugal force just helped it a little bit. So I found that by turning this valve on just a little bit, just cracking it, that's all you really need. You don't need the full force of the water. Just let it dribble like that, that's it. That's all you need. So again, that was pretty effortless. I don't think I hit rebar that time either. Somehow I got lucky both times. One thing I think that would help a lot with this drill is if this was at shoulder height, then you could put your whole body into it. You could lean into it. But being that it's like right on the ground here, I was trying to put my knee up against the back here and push it. And I found that that worked the best, but you need a nice amount of pressure going that way. So it's not totally convenient the way that I'm doing this right now, but I think in the right place you could make this a lot easier. Like if you were in the basement and this was four or five feet in the air, I think it would be a lot easier to push on this because you could put your whole body into it without stressing yourself too much. Because like it's six inches off the ground and I'm trying to put pressure on it and this stone is loose so I'm like losing my grip and stuff. But it did the trick and if I was to use my other drill I'd still be cutting out the foam right now. I wouldn't have even started on these holes yet. So this is a lot faster.
close it. I still think. Snake, look. Look, that's a Noah snake. A little tiny one. He can't even bite you.
so what I did here was repair this PVC pipe. This PVC pipe system is upside down right now. That's gonna go on the bottom, and basically what that does is help this whole loop float because we're gonna tie some bricks to this so that it goes to the bottom because when we put it in, there's not gonna be any water in these pipes, so they're gonna to wanna to float. So we put the bricks in there and then it will wanna sink, but it'll also want to float because of this PVC pipe because of the buoyancy of the space in between in this PVC pipe, there's just gonna be air so that'll help the loop float, but at the same time, there'll be bricks tied to it that'll keep it about a foot from the bottom so it doesn't get caught up in the muck or the mud. So when I was recovering this off of the job that we were gonna use it on, it was caught up in the weeds, and when I pulled it out, I broke a couple pieces, so that's why I had to repair that. So let me explain to the best of my ability what this loop is gonna do. I believe this is called a reverse return loop for ponds. I don't exactly understand exactly how that works, but basically it comes in with inch and a half geothermal pipe and then it leaves with inch and a half. And it branches off in various different ways down to, what's this, three quarter. These loops are three quarter inch. And if I remember correctly, they are 300 feet a piece. So we have 1200 feet of loop plus this is like 25 feet long, so there's another 50 feet of loop. But of course that 50 feet is much bigger diameter pipe. That's inch and a half, that is inch and a quarter. And something about the way this is designed is much more efficient than to just have like the inch and a half go into one loop and just go around. I guess it's like a manifold where it breaks off into each different branch instead of going in one end and then through that loop and through that loop and through that loop and continuing on i think it branches off into each one separately so i think the way it works is if one loop gets a kink in it somehow or somehow gets blocked up the whole thing isn't obsolete it will keep the flow up and i believe for the size system that i have i actually only need three of these loops so it's a little bit oversized by 25 percent and on top of that the loop going from the house to the pond is also like 130 feet. So that's another about 25% added on. So this loop all together is gonna be about 50% bigger than it needs to be, which should help with the efficiency of it. That way, if for some reason, part of that loop gets covered up in the pond by silt or dirt or something, it should survive even with half of it covered up. Another feature to this loop is these spacers. These spacers give a half inch between each different pipe in the loop, and that allows the water to flow freely through it. And that pond should never get below, I think 39 degrees is what people are saying, depending on your area and depending on how deep the pond is, and depending on how big the pond is too. So this loop is almost ready to be fused together with more inch and a half pipe to go out there. The only thing left I have to do is put a lot more zip ties on it because when we made this several years ago, we just used these zip ties because we put it together and we were gonna put it in the pond immediately. But these are not UV resistant, so they're very brittle and a lot of them broke. So I'm gonna put some black zip ties on there which are UV resistant and I'll get this all tied together and then we'll put it back on the telehandler and we'll have it ready for tomorrow. All right, so we got these holes drilled. And everybody should be here in a little bit. We're gonna install the outside loop that goes to this geothermal unit. Here is the flow center. So it's got two pumps on it. And this is the kind of flow center that's not pressurized. So as the air comes out, 
there's a reservoir here and the level of the water drops and you just keep filling it up and that's how you get the air out of this system. Normally you'd use a flush cart, but on this one, you don't use a flush cart. It's more of a DIY kind of flow center. And basically this controls the loop that goes in and out of the geothermal unit. That's the source. And then the load is where it goes and feeds the inside work. So the source is on the right, the load is on the left. The load goes to this buffer tank, heats it up, circulates around, and then out from the buffer tank goes into the rest of the system, like the manifold here, and then I'm gonna have also where it goes to other loops that go to the fan coils for air conditioning. So when it's hot out, this will be filled with cold water for the air conditioning. When it's cold out, this will be filled with hot water for heating. And then this is the domestic water and this will get hooked up so that that geothermal unit will circulate around in there through a heat exchanger basically so the water coming from that system never touches the domestic water because you can contaminate it it just heats it up separately so that it's not touching so because the coils in this unit are so small there's actually two different coils and you have to pipe them both in Otherwise, it will short circuit the system. So we're gonna concentrate on getting the outside loop installed today. And we're gonna be doing what they call socket fusion, which basically, there's butt fusion and there's socket fusion. Socket fusion is where there's like a coupler like this, like you'd have on a normal PVC pipe, except you melt the pipe into this coupler. Butt fusion is where you take the pipe and you just melt the pipe to the pipe, which is really strong but I think this might be just a little bit stronger because there's more plastic so then when you come into the system you have these adapters where it goes from the fusion pipe to a brass adapter male threaded so this is a pipe that we're using it's special geothermal pipe it's inch and a half it's pretty thick wall it's like 316 thick it's pretty durable stuff we're letting it sit out in the sun right now because we need to take two of these and bend them for around that corner. Because it's kind of a sharp corner for this pipe anyways. But the whole reason for this is because I want to put an addition here in the future. So I didn't want to really round it too much because that would limit how far the addition can come out in the future. And I couldn't get too far that way because I got the trees there and I didn't really want to get involved in that. So we've all been kind of brainstorming whether we should start there and work our way to the pond or start at the pond and work our way this way. I think either way will work just fine. We're trying to figure out which is just a little bit better. The one thing that you don't want to do is form up the whole loop going all the way to the pond and hook it into the loop that goes in the pond and then backfill it. Because as you're backfilling it, if you imagine the pipes are parallel with each other, as you're backfilling it, they could switch like this a little bit and it could put a lot of stress on the pipe. So that's why we got to either install the pipe here, bring it around and backfill it as we go and then drop it in the pond or we got to start at that end and put it in the pond, fuse everything together and backfill as we go this way. But if we start at that end, put the loop in the pond and fuse our way this way, then we don't really have to backfill as we go because those two ends will be loose so if it shifts like one way or the other it's fine because it's just going to get cut off in there and it's going to have some elbows which we can do after it's backfilled.
Now, is this one just there to, to tell you where the where you need to stop it or where it needs to go to? It's doing that and it's a cold ring, so it helps to cool it down. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, this is uh, your gauger. You put this on and then you put the cold ring up to it and that gives you your depth. Okay. And then <clears throat> when you push it in, you want to make sure you're flush all the way around or fairly close. And then uh, it's the cold ring, it helps cool it down. So that does like three things then, really. What's that, this? Yeah. 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 And if you need to get leverage too, you could pull on that. It doesn't really, it stays pretty uh, pretty tight. Yeah. Yeah, you could almost put like a clamp between the two of them if you really needed to too. Yeah. Um, and then the other key too is you know, holding it together long enough. Once you're done, you can't just let it butt and then walk away. Yeah. You got to do almost double the time, I believe, of what your joint requires for heating. So if it's like 15 seconds, you're supposed to hold it together for 30 seconds. You okay. Know? Um, and all these pipe sizes have different time requirements. Yeah. The fusion tool. Yeah, it's like PVC pipe. Everybody sticks them together and they walk away, but you're really supposed to hold it for like 30 yeah. seconds. And then Otherwise, they push the size out. too. Yeah. yeah. It's super reliable, you know, as far as like from the expansions and the, the press fittings and all that, which are reliable too. But this, I think this will last forever, as long as the pipe will last. That's yeah. Will. So now, does that thing have like a that bevels it too? So you got to bevel yeah, it. Yeah. This um, what's they called a um. Chamfers it. Chamfer, yeah. yeah. You chamfer it. It just helps with it getting on. You know, it's always harder sliding on a butt joint. Yeah. And it's just basic couplings with a stop. And that's it. You clean them. You don't have to get crazy with cleaning them. Just clean off some of the dirt. Yeah. Um, I like using wet and dry. And then that's it. But you always got to check your gun. See his. It's got a digital thermometer. Yeah, it's digital. It's a little, uh, some of the markings you can't read. Oh, but yeah. I can still see what indicates a 5 and 500 is what you're going for. Okay. If you're 493, 498, you're fine. But, you know, if you're not paying attention and you lose power or something and you think you're still on, yeah. next thing you know, you're at 350 and you're like, oh, no. So you always, I always recommend just checking the gun. You yeah. Know, I know what 500 is on this, so I always check it. Yeah. Um, super important. Super important, but... Yeah, I wonder what makes this special about ge being for geothermal instead of just regular poly pipe. I wonder, like maybe the density of it or something. I think that and like the melt rate, you know? I yeah, mean, that could be. Because how it does it is it, it melts everything but the inner. Yep. You know, because in every, and if you go too long, you can melt the inner, you know? And I guess the smaller the pipe, you know, you got to be more crucial Yeah. with your time. But that's what I'm assuming it is <clears throat> and how it actually, you know, cures back together there could be different you know products in it to make it cure better together i don't know yeah do it. i wonder if the insulating factor of the pipe is, is brought into play when they consider it a geothermal pipe too because you don't want something that's more porous that insulates more you want i guess you would want more dense uh structure to it because then it won't insulate so much yeah maybe that's part of it too should be able to get that other side. Perfect. Good.
like right there, perfect. Good. Yep. Good. adjustment needed. <laughs> Not bad, right? Yeah. Looks Are you going to count? I'm going to count. You count. Ready? Yep.
took an unwanted bath. <laughs> Man, that cell phone sure can dig. All right, so at this point, what we're doing is testing out the loop. We're gonna put 100 pounds of pressure in it. Just air, 100 PSI. And we're gonna fill it up from the other end and just test for any leaks. And while Eric is doing that, me and Pat are gonna come over here and attach the blocks to this. So we need to attach one block for each side of each loop. So eight blocks. And it might not be quite enough, so we might have to use another half block in conjunction with that. And then once we got the blocks hooked up, we can drop this loop in here as long as we don't have any leaks. So that'll be done for that part of it. And then we can start backfilling from here, backfilling into the building. Got the old mafia shoes on here. Yep. <laughs> mafia boots. This thing ain't talking to nobody now. <laughs> It's looking good. I knew that though, it's not very likely that we'd have a leak, but it's good to test it. Eric was also saying that he has an additive that you can put in here if you have a leak that's up to an eighth of an inch hole and it'll plug it up. So if anything ever springs a leak in the future, you just add that chemical to it and it'll patch up the hole. And he said he's used it before on other people's work and it worked. He's never had anything that he had to use it on for himself, but he's had to go in other jobs where other people did the work and then it leaked and he went in afterwards and fixed the leak with that chemical. So it's good to know that you have that for a backup. I wouldn't want it running through the system unless it had to though.
Okay, so last night we set this loop, but it was the end of the day. We didn't really have time to get it finished. So as you can see, I was a little bit off on my buoyancy calculator. I tried to calculate the volume of air inside of all these pipes, convert it to buoyancy, and add enough weight. And I even added a little extra, but it wasn't enough because it's not sinking. So we need to go out in the boat and add some blocks. I'm gonna add a half a block to each side. So eight half blocks, they're like, I think 24 pounds a piece. Hopefully that should do it. I think on the right side where this inch and a half header is, it's probably gonna need maybe a little bit more. Maybe we'll have to use a full block over there. But in any case, I have 500 pounds of blocks on there right now, and that's not enough. So we're gonna be up to like, I think 700 pounds by the time I'm done. So the plan after that is to probe around in the water just to make sure that where I have it is deep enough because I think we're going to have to shift it over to the right and maybe even pull it out a little bit more. So we'll actually do that before we put the blocks on and then we'll let that sink down. And then right here, I don't know what the condition is of the soil here. It could be nothing but rocks here and I don't want those pipes laying on rocks. So what we're going to have to do is dump a bunch of sand here, maybe with the excavator, and then we can lay these pipes down. I'll have to push them down and lay more sand on top of them, enough to cover it to where I'm confident they'll be protected from this rock and stuff. And then we'll just dump regular soil on top of it and build up a dam here. So we'll build up a dam for maybe six or eight feet here. And then once we get the dam built up, we can come over here and pump all this water out of here and then we can dump more sand in here along the bottom and then push this down because this is going to keep floating too. So the idea of what I'm trying to tell you right now is that I want to make sure that there's nothing underneath this that's going to puncture this pipe. And I don't know right now because the water's there. So I'm trying to take precautionary measures to make sure that we don't have any places that are going to puncture the pipe. Up here where there's no water we got sand laid everywhere, so we know that it's not gonna puncture the pipe. But down here, I have no idea because this is just underwater. All right, so the camera keeps turning off because it's too hot, but we got a dam here now and I put some stepping stones so you can step across. So now we can pump that out and we can make sure there's sand underneath the pipe, put sand on top of it and then start backfilling this. It's really tedious to do this though because this pipe really wants to float. So Pat was in there standing on the pipe to 
make sure it wouldn't float and then we were filling it at the same time. What are you guys doing? We're all digging. Digging? Ah! We're digging to build the highest tower ever. And then, oh, that's good. And then this... the mound. My Plus, we're eat. trying to clean up. And then the mound. We're trying to clean up. Why do I need to stop driving? I was just making a video. What, you tired? Yeah. Well, I'm tired a little bit. You tired a little bit? We've been doing this pr practically. Practically since well, you left. Well, good, because you spread the pile out and it was hard to get it with the skid steer. So now you're making the pile bigger again so I can get it. Plus, we also want it to look cool. So it's been raining for the last few days, so I figured it's a good time to get some work done inside for this geothermal system. So up here, 
in this chase area, there's a bunch of things I need to do. I'm gonna have fan coil units over top of each one of these bedroom doors. So I'm gonna have three fan coil units up here and I'm gonna put a manifold up there to control them. So I'm gonna put a three port manifold up here and it's gonna have some thermal actuators on it. They're like zone valves. So I need to get that all set up and I'll show you these fan coils. So they look just like a ductless mini split, but they are run off of hydronics instead of refrigerant. So it's the same exact setup. They look identical. They pretty much are identical, except for the fact that there is two hoses that are half inch threaded that just go to water. So you have cool water going through them they also do heat too. They're for heating and cooling, but I have no use for the heat because I have the radiant heat in the floor. Now I probably will hook these up so that they're run off of secondary heat. So in other words, if the thermostat is calling for heat and some time goes by and the temperature doesn't raise or it even lowers, then it'll kick the secondary heat on, which I can program it in to use the heat off of this for that. But the complicated part about that is that I'm probably only going to have 90 degree water running through for the radiant heat. And I could raise that up to 120, 130, 140 for the fan coils and then I could use a mixing valve to get it back down for the radiant heat. But I'm not going to get involved in that. If these need to kick on, they're just going to have to deal with the 90 degree water, which they're not going to be crazy efficient at 90 degrees. but. Like I said, I don't have really any intentions on using them. So if they're a backup or secondary heat, 90 degrees will probably be fine. So in order to install these on the wall, I have to have an outlet. And I can either have the outlet on the left or the right. And then these are insulated half inch lines for the incoming and outgoing water. And then there's also a condensation drain port which is extremely important for the cooling because you're gonna have condensation. For heating, you don't need that. Now normally when you buy a unit like this from a good name brand company, for some reason they're like two grand a piece, which is crazy because it's just a fan coil, which is like a radiator with a fan on it and a couple controls and it's not that hard to make. But I found this company and I got these from mbtech.com. I'll leave a link in the description. I'm not affiliated with them and I'm not sponsored by them, but I found these units for like $400 a piece, which was night and day difference between these and all the other fan coils that I found. For some reason, there's not a lot of companies that make these and I don't know why. It's just not very popular to do this kind of setup, I guess. But these are a 1.5 ton unit, which means 18,000 BTUs. So we need to mount these in a way where we can have the drain port drain gravity fed so we got to make sure we're above everything up there so that we can gravity feed it into the drain which I left over there that goes down over here into where the washing machine and dryer are so before I do anything in that little attic I want to get the manifold situated so that I know where I'm going to and from with the units with the pipes and everything so this is a three port radiant manifold that I had downstairs for my temporary heat 
and I'm going to convert that into what I need for this, which I'm going to have to insulate the whole thing. But for right now, if I can get everything hooked up so that all I need to do is bring it up there and screw it in and then hook up my PEX, which I'm going to be using expansion fittings with the Upener HE PEX. But it's just a lot easier to hook up anything I can down here first, all the threaded fittings, and then bring it upstairs and just hang it. So basically the idea of the supply coming in is going to have the hot, in this case it's actually going to be the cold, but just for the purpose of keeping everything on the same page, this is going to be the supply. So on the supply I'm going to have an air valve, which that's not a hood scoop, but I figured it would be close enough where it should be able to get the air out. That's going to be the highest point on the entire house for all the loops. So it's important that I get the air out right there because otherwise the air is going to pass through there and have to come back down all the way to the basement, two stories down. So it's important that I get the air out there otherwise it might take me months to get the air out. So like I said normally you put a hood scoop there where it kind of brings the fluid up and back down but I think this should be alright the way that I got it like this. And that valve right there somehow knows to let out air but not water. I don't know really how it works, but it works. So this is an adapter to three quarter expansion pecs, and that is two. So we got the opener three quarter HE pecs, which is the oxygen barrier pecs. So we'll hook those up. I already got those lines run. Those are pre-insulated. And everything here has to be insulated because this is for cooling, which I may not even get a chance to use it this year because it's already getting pretty cold, but I want to get it tested anyways. So these are just drain ports. Just gonna... So now this board is where this manifold is going to sit. So we'll put that all the way like that and then screw it to it and then I'll screw that entire assembly up to some studs up there. I'll show you that in a minute. I was going to insulate this whole thing before I put it in there, but at the same time I got thinking about it, I want to be able to access all this and see what's going on, and especially during testing and getting all the air out and um, configuring the loops to make sure I got the right gallons per minute and you know incoming outgoing temperature. So I don't want to cover this all up with insulation right now, even though it would have been easier to do it while it's down here rather than up in that attic space. I think. What I'm actually going to end up doing here is making a little box to cover this out of like one inch insulation. So actually I'm going to end up putting foam around the back side of this wood, the front side, the sides, and the front I'll have like a little access panel for it. Something that I can open up with a hinge or something that's sealed up. Because the deal is you can either insulate tight to it or as long as the space around it is insulated and it gets conditioned, which means 
Like if I got cold running in these pipes and I got this whole thing boxed off with insulation, well the air inside of that little area is going to be cold and conditioned so it won't condensate. So rather than wrap everything tight and not have access to anything, I'll just make like a little chilled box for it. But at this point, I'm not really too worried about insulating anything because the only thing I'm going to do with this is test it because the weather is just getting cold anyway, so I'm not going to need the air conditioning. So I'm just going to run it long enough to test it so I can insulate it next year sometime. All right, so getting to this point was a pain because I'm cramped up in a corner here and just not easy to get to everything. And with the expansion tool, you need to push on things and it's hard because there's just like no room here. Because this space goes to a point right here. So the headroom gets less, the width gets less, but I got the manifold hooked up and the lines going to it are insulated. So I just need to put some tape around these 
and then I need to worry about insulating this whole thing but that's later at least I got this for now Alright, so now that I got these fan coils installed, I am going to go up in the attic and hook them all up to the manifold. And the one that's downstairs that I installed last in the kitchen runs down separately that doesn't go to the manifold. So it's just the three of them up here that go to this manifold. And we got the stub outs right there right there and right there so it's nice and easy access now I need to insulate the pipe going from there to the manifold
I figured though with the fan coil, it wouldn't hurt to be oversized with it because it's not like it's it's not like it's turning on a compressor every time, you know. Yeah. It's not like it's turning on and off a compressor. Yeah, bro. Short cycling and stuff. Well, the only thing it's doing is turning on a circulator pump. That's it. So. That's what's nice about those. Yeah. That's nice too. Well, that's what I'm saying about the. I, that's they're oversized, but I don't think it really matters at all. No, it doesn't. Not not when it comes to uh, that. Nope. I don't really like that. Never freezing anything out. So we got the loop coming in from the outside, goes up and around. Now we're gonna install the flow center. Install right here. That way one of the loop pipes goes up, the other one goes to the unit. I like the other saw, I kinda like that one. This one doesn't have no light. I don't know how long it is, if that is the right size piece. wiring for my controllers and my zone valves and my thermal actuators for all the different systems in the house right now let me explain kind of what I got going on here so upstairs I have three fan coil zones each one of them is a loop that's gonna need a thermal actuator I got four radiant zones and each one of them is one loop so there's four loops on the first floor I have one fan coil and I have one radiant zone but it has three loops and then in the basement I just have one radiant zone with three loops so what I did is I bought a six zone Taco expandable controller and that is this right here and that's going to mainly control these loops right here and then I also bought a four zone Taco expandable controller for upstairs for the fan coils. So I made sure to buy an expandable controller for each one that way you can link them up together and they both will control one pump. That's the circulator pump. That's going to be circulating all of the loops between the radiant and the fan coils. Everything is going to be controlled by one circulator pump. And for those of you that don't know, I was told by a lot of people that this is one of the best circulator pumps that you can get for something like this. The Grunfos, I don't know if I pronounced that right, Alpha 2. Basically, this is a ECM pump which almost controls everything by itself. So there's different settings on it for different speeds for the pump, but it can also auto-adapt. So... The max running watts for this is 45, which is like crazy low. And basically, you almost don't even need to wire this into the controller. You could actually just leave this hooked up and it will sense when a valve opens up and it will ramp up the speed of the pump. And then as soon as that valve closes, 
it'll ramp it down. So that's the circulator pump between all the zones, between the fan coils and the radiant loops. It does everything. So I'm not 100% sure about it, but it almost seems like you don't even have to hook it up to the controller. You could actually just give it power and let it do its thing. But I'm going to hook it up anyways because there's no reason not to. So in other words, I'm going to hook it up so that whenever any of these zones turn on, the pump will turn on too. And that's the whole point of getting expandable controllers is that if you turn on something in this controller, it will turn on the pump in here. The pump is going to be hooked to this one. And if you turn on the controls anywhere along these two boards, it'll turn on that pump. Now, if you were to not have expandable controllers and they would be separate, now you would have a hard time having this controller turn on this pump because these are not linked together. So that's why I got an expandable controller. So the expandable controller has three wires that link them together. See, that says expansion right there. So you take three wires, thermostat wires, 18 gauge, you hook it A, B, and C, and you do the same thing on the other controller to the corresponding letters, A, B, and C. So then this one would be the master, which I know that's kind of blurry, but that says there's there's these dip switches here and this is master and slave so this one would stay the master because the pumps gonna be on this one so then every other controller that you have after that is gonna be on slave and now they're hooked together so that when the other controller turns on it will turn on the pump that's hooked to this one which the pump will get hooked right to here pump and switch So now on these controllers, up here is for the thermostats. And I just hooked something up just to test it out real quick. I hooked up the first floor thermostat. Right now I have zone one is actually powering the thermostat. Here's the common that powers the thermostat. And then there's the R and W, red and white. And that's gonna be for the heat. And the R is power that switches over to the W when you turn on the heat. And then zone two, which this is not permanent, I just I was just testing things out here. So zone two, I have the yellow hooked to the W and the yellow is for cooling. So when I turn on the thermostat upstairs, which is hooked to my phone here, basically, if I turn on the heat, then zone one will turn on here. So we'll just crank up this heat a little bit, turn it on that, and then you'll see zone one. See, zone one just turned on. Okay, now if I turn the heat off, that will turn off. Okay, so now if I want to turn the cooling on, which would be the fan coil upstairs, that is going to be, it, it takes a minute because it's on the app and it's got to go through the internet. It's got to go like around the world and back to here. So now if I put the cooling down to 65, now it will turn on zone 2. So that's zone two. So basically what that's doing is zone one is right here. That's going to this thermal actuator, which there will actually be three of them hooked up to that zone because we got three loops going in from the first floor into one zone. And then zone two will control another thermal actuator, but it won't be in here. It'll be actually a zone valve single zone valve right here and that's going to turn on the controls to open up the loop for my cooling for my fan coil on the first floor okay so that's how that works and then we're going to hook up the rest of the radiant loops to this controller and then we're going to hook up the upstairs fan coils to the other controller so when any one of these zones turns on it will turn on the pump which I don't have hooked up yet but I'm just trying to get everything wired up for now because it's pretty complicated 
a lot of thermostat wires here. And each one of these has five wires. These are going upstairs. And then I also got more for the first floor and more for the basement. So basically, on the thermostats, one thermostat is going to control the cooling and the heating. So upstairs there's going to be four thermostats. Um, one is going to control the bathroom, which is only going to have radiant heat on it. There's no fan coil in there. And then the other three are going to have fan coils and radiant zones in them. So from those thermostats, you're going to have these wires coming into this controller, all three of these. And then from the radiant side of the thermostats, those wires are also going to be coming into this controller. And that controller is going to control a three port manifold upstairs, which you guys saw me install in the attic, which is all insulated and everything. All right, so in each room, I'm gonna be installing this EcoB3 light, and this is compatible with fan coils, and it's compatible with radiant heat. In the past, I've used Nest thermostats, and they're decent, but I've heard some really good stuff about these EcoBs, so I'm gonna try these out. So this is gonna be in every room. So to hook this up, they want you to put power on the RC, which is for power on cold, and then the Y1 is going to turn on the AC. The green is going to be for fan. The RH, you use that if you're using a separate transformer from the air conditioner, which in this case we are. So we're going to have to put, so we're going to have to put a wire in the RH. The C is for common, that's like a neutral. And the W1 is going to have the white wire, which is going to turn on the heat. So that's the wires that we're going to be hooking up. And this is kind of neat because they give you a little level right on here so you can tell exactly when it's level. I'm going to use these little anchor screws for self-drilling.
All right, so yellow goes here. Green is actually going to be the heat power. Red is going to go here. White is going to go at the W. And then blue is the common. So, just like that, that's wired up. Stick this on here. Now, I have a switch that I put right here, which is like, kind of like the boiler switch, I guess you could say. It's the shutoff for the control valves up there and all the fan coils all at once. So I'm gonna turn that on. All right, guys, so I hate to do this to you, but I think we got to wrap up this video. I still have a lot of work ahead of me. And if I was to make this one continuous video, it would probably be four or five hours long, which I think is a little bit unreasonable. So we'll break this down into two videos. Also, Eric had to go away for a couple weeks, so I am at a standstill right now. So it makes sense that we just sort of break it up right here. Still need to hook up all the thermal actuators there, hook them into the controller. We still need to get everything else hooked up like an air purge we need the expansion tank the fill valve uh, backflow preventer we got a few things left to do for the source side of this geothermal heat pump so this is going to go here that's part of the loop this part of the loop is going to go into there and then there's going to be another pipe that goes from here to there and then that will complete the source side, which is the loop. That's the pond loop. And then we need to flush out the system of all the contaminants. And, you know, there's like little pieces of shavings from chamfering and just all different kinds of debris that we need to get out. So we need a flush cart to do that, which is basically just like a really high powered pump that shoots the water through the whole system and brings it out into a bag filter. Then we need to wire up the unit and then the unit powers these two pumps here those are the source pumps which basically powers the loop that goes outside that brings it in and out of the unit and then we also need to hook up the load pump which brings the water from the unit into that tank which is the buffer tank 120 gallon buffer tank so basically that's going to have a hydrostat on it and whenever that gets low on the temperature it's going to tell that unit to kick on and it's going to circulate water until it gets hot enough and then that hydrostat which is kind of like an aquastat tells it to turn off and then also on that tank there's going to be another pump which is the Grunfos which is going to power the loops and that's an open tank so it's not like there's two different sides like that tank this tank is a domestic hot water tank, so it's got a coil in it so that the water feeding it to heat it up never touches the water that's in it. But that tank is not like that. That tank just has water going through it one way and then through it the other way. And if both pumps are running at once, it's fine. So also one thing I never really mentioned before is there is a D superheater here too, which I have this tape covering up that. That is actually a half inch port here. Which I just taped it so it doesn't get like bugs and stuff in it. But that is a desuperheater, which, if you know anything about geothermal systems, you know that a desuperheater basically takes the excess heat while you're cooling. Instead of taking the heat and pumping it into the ground, you are using that heat to heat water. So it's like a super efficient way to heat domestic water almost for free. Really, it is for free. 
Actually, it's even better than free because you're also lessening the load on the system because instead of pumping the heat into the ground, you are pumping it into the tank. So now you're cooling off your loop, which if you're in cooling mode, will make it more efficient. So somehow I'm gonna figure out how to use that D superheater in conjunction with this domestic hot water tank, which is basically using the geothermal system to heat that up. And this is actually very rare for you to find a system that also heats the domestic hot water in the house, but it's super efficient to do this. Now this tank was expensive. I think this was about $2,200 for this tank. That is really expensive. It's gonna take me a long time to recoup this, but, just so you guys know, there is some incentives to install these systems. So my utility company, Central Hudson, is actually gonna basically give me a check for, I think it's between seven and $8,000 to install this system. It goes $2,000 per 10,000 BTUs. So I guess technically this is considered a three and a half ton unit. So I think the system is about 42,000 BTUs. So, so I should be getting a check for about $8,400 from the utility company. And that's just from them. You also get a 30% tax credit too for the whole system, for everything that's involved, except for the domestic hot water. That's not part of that. But anything involving the radiant, the controls, the loop, the flow center, the pipes, everything that's involved, you get 30% tax credit back from that. So between that and the utility company credit, it's very comparable to a regular system that you would install in a house, except for the fact that now I have something that's super efficient. It's gonna use a lot less energy. So I can't tell you exactly how much this system is gonna run me altogether, but on the next video, I should have an idea because we didn't really go over the finances yet between everything, so I don't really know yet. Like I said, I know it's gonna be a lot of money, tens of thousands of dollars, but then you got the incentives that you can get back, and then also your utility bills are drastically, drastically lower. I'm not doing this because it's like a green system that's environmentally friendly or anything. I'm doing this to save money on my utility bills. And to be completely honest, if I didn't already have that pond loop, I would have for sure just done horizontal loops, probably going around the pond, around the outside of the pond, I would have dug a trench, going all the way around and back again, between six and 800 feet for a trench. And that's probably what I would have done if I didn't have the pond loop already from that other job. Because that was a lot of work and I don't think it was worth it. And I don't think it's gonna perform as well as a horizontal loop or a well, which is another option. But I will be monitoring it pretty closely to see what the COPs are. So let me just explain a few more things about this system. I'll get into it more next time, but this system right here, to hook this up to the power, I need a 40 amp circuit. And basically, because I, it says a minimum of 32.2, so I gotta go to 40 amps, and that's at 240 volts, one phase. And the locked rotor amps is 115. So in other words, when this starts up, it needs 115 amps to start. And that's only for a split second. Like, I don't know, a tenth of a second or 20th of a second or something like that. But that's a massive load to start up. So, so we ordered an IntelliStart, which is basically, I think, I don't know how it exactly works, but I think it's like a little capacitor that you put in there and it reduces the starting amps from 115 down to 40, which if you know anything about geothermal systems and off-grid with generators or solar or whatever, or batteries, you know that that IntelliStart is extremely important. That IntelliStart was like $600, but I almost need it because we got a lot of stuff running off of one 200 amp circuit here. Not just my house, but I have another two buildings over there that are also running off of it. So. It's gonna be pretty important that I get that installed. And so one of the reasons why I'm doing such a detailed video about this is because I've searched before on YouTube for videos about geothermal and there's just not a lot out there. Most people only have a water to air system. So in other words, instead of having a water to water system like this, this is water and that's water. What you would normally have is water to air, which 
there would be a bigger unit here with some duct work on it and then you would duct that in your house. Now that's better for cooling because you already have the cooling built into it. All you have to do is hook it up to the duct work, which some people retrofit in their house and they hook it up to their existing duct work. Or if you're doing a new house, you just install duct work. I don't want any duct work in my house. I don't want a system that's forced air like that. Um, another advantage to this is this is set up for radiant heat. If you don't have a water to water system, you can't really use radiant heat. There might be a different way you can do it where there's like a split system or something, but this is meant for water. So that's why I wanted to go with this system because my heat is going to be radiant heat. That's the main heat. I may use something as secondary heat, but this is going to be the main heat in the house, which is the best heat and the most efficient and comfortable heat that you can have. Now it does become a problem when you have a system like this and you really want cooling because then you got to get involved in something like I have, which is the fan coils. And that's dipping into an unknown area that most geothermals installers do not get involved in. As a matter of fact, most of them don't even do water to water systems. I would say 80% of the geothermal installers out there only do water to air systems. And there's a reason for that because it's a lot easier and they're cheaper. But this is more efficient and it's more what I want. It works better for my scenario and I've been thinking about this for 10 years now. This is what I've wanted and this is what I got. And I guess my point is I'm making this video so detailed about this because for so long I've wanted to watch a video just like this to explain exactly what's involved without having to bug Eric too much because there's so much involved into it that for me to keep asking him a million questions, I'm sure he's getting annoyed with that. So I'm at the point now where I pretty much know what I'm doing. We just need to get everything installed. And now at this point, I could install one on the next house probably by myself as long as I have a way to fuse pipes. I, basically, I got to get a pipe fuser. Now, Water Furnace does not allow you to buy units from them unless you are certified by them, which you have to take classes and you have to spend thousands of dollars to get training. And you cannot buy that from them unless you do that. So if I do a system like that, I either have to get it somehow or I have to go with another company or something or even go through the training. I'm not really sure, but they probably don't even want to do that for me because I'm not going to install a lot of them. But there are other units out there that are available that are pretty good. I think Water Furnace is the best though. So we'll see how it goes going forward on other houses and stuff. But the one last thing that I want to mention is according to my calculations in this house with how tight it is and how the insulation is, it's just really a thermally efficient house. I think that I only need about a two ton heating and cooling load on this house which this is, I think, three and a half tons. So it's quite a bit overkill, but that's the whole point of having this tank right here because rather than short cycle the system and run for a little bit and then turn off and then run for a little bit and turn off, it runs for a while, heats up that tank, which is 120 gallons, and then it doesn't run for a while. So on a really cold day, that might only run once during the whole day and it might heat the house for the rest of the day or maybe twice. So it's not going to be running very much. But it's not like every time a loop calls for heat, that system turns on. That's not the way it works. That system only turns on when that tank tells it to. And the hydrostat on that tank is basically the control to control the temperature. So when I want to switch it to cooling, that hydrostat gets switched to the cooling on my phone, actually. I can switch that over to cooling mode. So I can't do cooling and heating at the same time. There's ways to do that if you want, but it's a lot more expensive and I have no interest in that. When it gets cold enough for heat, I turn the heat on. When it gets warm enough for cooling, I turn the cooling on. But anyways, that's enough for this video. We got plenty to cover on the next video and I'll go over some of this stuff that I just talked about on the next video. I'm sure there's going to be some people interested in this system to install on their house, especially with the incentives that you have and the lower utility bills going forward. So I'll explain more about that moving forward on the next video. So that's it for this one and I'll catch you guys on the next one.